Hi there, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, hear me okay. It's good to see so many uh, familiar names on the attendee list. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know me, my name's David Hogg. I am the General Manager for Stantex Water Business in New Zealand. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it gives me great pleasure to, to bring this uh, webinar to, to New Zealand. I know um, Nicole McLennan from our um, Waterloo office in uh, Ontario has presented this, this webinar um, a couple of times in North America and had some really good feedback. And um, obviously, um, I think one of those presentations had over 500 attendees. So it's, it's clearly really topical. Um, COVID-19 has caused massive disruption to um, you know, the global economy and it obviously filters through to the way we work and uh, the systems that we deal with. Um, and so this particular webinar is focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on water and wastewater utilities. Um, and I know Nicole has tried to tailor this uh, somewhat to the New Zealand sector, but um, you know, I think it's it's really important that that we realise um, that learning's a two-way thing. So Nicole uh, will present to us, and no doubt we will pick up some snippets from from the um, from the webinar. But e equally, Nicole, um, I expect, will pick up what we are um, experiencing and how we're managing things in New Zealand. So it's learning's a two-way thing. Um, and on that, I, um, I, the webinar is going to last for about 40 minutes and there will be some opportunities for um, questions after that, probably about 20 minutes. And the way we're going to manage the questions is that if you have a look at the dashboard that you've got in front of you, there's a, a question box that l will enable you to, to type in questions throughout the presentation. That they will only be seen by myself, so don't be shy, don't be worried about your spelling, send them through, I will collate those and um, and we'll we'll pass those through to Nicole after she's presented and, and we'll see um, and see what we can cover there. I'll try and get through many, as many questions as we can. So it looks like we've got um, a few attendees on. We're probably still waiting for a couple, but nonetheless we'll, we'll we'll get started. And I'll start this with a with a safety moment. And as you can probably see, um, I'm working from home as everyone else is at the moment. It's it's a crazy time. Um, and you know who would have thought back in, in January that we would have been in lockdown for six weeks working from home and, and making the best of a, a pretty bad situation. And so obviously we're all working, I'm working at the kitchen table, um, clearly our desks and our, uh, our office set up at home has not had an ergonomic assessment. It's, it's worth reminding though that we should um, probably make sure that we have a look at our desk layout um, and you know, get up and move around and stretch and um, and you know, take a phone call uh, whilst whilst walking. You know, get some exercise and get some fresh air. Don't spend all day um, stuck at home inside. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to read Nicole's bio and um, and I think let me just get that up on the screen. Nicole, as I said before, is a process specialist from our Waterloo office in Ontario. She has over 13 years experience related to water quality and treatment. She is the lead author of Stantec's white paper, Considerations for Water and Wastewater Treatment Related to the Recent Outbreak of COVID-19. Her areas of expertise comprise water treatment, optimization, regulatory compliance, process performance demonstrations, energy optimization, management and disinfection byproducts, control of algal blooms, distribution system management, scientific study designs, and wastewater disinfection. Crikey, there's a lot going on there, Nicole. Um, Nicole is pursuing her PhD to improve the detection of waterborne viruses and better inform risk assessments for water management. So Nicole, thank you very much for your time. I know it's, it's getting on late in the evening uh, where you are. So thank you, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Dave. It's really also my pleasure to uh, be broadcasting to you from Canada this evening and uh, your morning, I guess, um, and to share with you what myself and my author uh, co-authors found on uh, COVID-19 in water and what the risks might be to our practice and how we could respond. Um, so this uh, information was originally collated in February updated in March and then just updated more recently now. So the information hasn't changed that much, um, but hopefully it will still help um, bring some consensus to maybe some pieces of information that you've heard from different outlets 
uh, and also as you return to work, what the ongoing uh, concerns or considerations might be. So, today we're going to look at sort of an introduction to coronaviruses. Essentially, I'm going to go over Viruses 101 and make sure that we're all on the same page about what a virus is and what we know about this particular virus, and that'll help us understand what the risks are. And then we'll look at how effective treatment is, especially if you have questions about uh, treatment on the wastewater side or from the public with respect to the safety of drinking water. And then we'll look at uh, considerations for operators, mostly wastewater operators who are still being called to work, um, how to address some public concerns, and we have an infographic to summarize the, these ideas, and I promise to leave 20 minutes for uh, Q&A. So I have to start this, of course, with a disclaimer because there's a lot of unknowns right now. Um, there's new information coming out every day and we sort of have to sift through that and see what's been peer reviewed, what's preliminary and uh, take that with caution right now. We don't have a extensive body of literature on the presence and fate and transport and treatment efficacy for this particular virus, but we can look at the structure of the virus and make some inferences there. And then um, we know that all kinds of things can impact treatment. So that whole section that we're gonna look at, you know, comes with a big asterisk and, and is generally vague. So initially um, we wanted to present this information to share with all of our clients and stakeholders um, what we found on this virus. And so let's look at, you know, some basics. We know that viruses are biological entities with small genomes. Here's a little figure of a schematic of a virus, if you will. So we may ha ha we'll definitely have a genome. It's either RNA or DNA, nucleic acid uh, sequence there, and then a protein capsid. And then some viruses also have this lipid envelope. I assume you can see my pointer there, but I'll just get it on spotlight. Um, okay. So uh, some viruses also have an envelope like COVID-19, a lipid envelope. So that's quite unique to this uh, group of viruses. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is a zoonotic viruses. So these are viruses that um, have originated in an animal species and evolved to infect humans. Um, they tend to have very high mutation rates. So we that's why we typically don't see these kinds of outbreaks from you know, bacteria or protozoa pathogens. And we know that they tend to have a fairly narrow host range. So they do essentially evolve from being able to infect an animal species to being able to infect a human. Um, and that is usually because of close contact with humans that they have those opportunities. Um, we know that viruses need a ho host cell to replicate. So they don't replicate on their own in the environment like bacterial cells might do. Um, but they essentially cause infection by binding to a receptor protein on the surface of one of your cells. Uh, for example, it could be a human lung cell in your respiratory tract. And they convince the cell to take it up, or at least they inject their genome. And that in, um, sort of hijacks your cell to create um, new virus progeny, new replications of themselves of the vi new viruses, so new genomes and new capsids. And then they're packaged within your cell and they either are released by rupturing the host cell or by budding out and actually taking some of that lipid cell membrane of yours with it, along with some of its own proteins. So that's some basics on uh, vi human viruses, I guess. I just lost my pointer there. Okay, so um, how do we detect viruses in water? This information is really important to help us understand the studies that are coming out now and the research that's being done right now. So we essentially have two methods. Um, there's a couple other methods, but generally two methods to look at viruses in water. And so cell culture methods are um, were initially used and that's where we would apply your water sample to a monolayer of human cells grown in a lab or mammalian cells grown in a lab. Um, and we look for evidence of viral infection or what we call cytopathic effect or plaque uh, in that monolayer. So that takes quite a bit of time, can take weeks. 
Um, and the, these results, though, tell us that likely in that sample there was infectious virus present. These methods have a slew of limitations, unfortunately. They're expensive, time-consuming, they're susceptible to contamination. So, for example, if you have you know, a wastewater sample with all kinds of other constituents, have some issues there. Oh my goodness. Um, I just have an alert saying that my computer is going to restart, but it says I have an hour, so we should be okay. Um, I know Tony was worried about some um, technical issues here. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm just going to get rid of it if I can. Huh. Okay, we'll carry on. Um, okay, so these methods, uh, unfortunately, are currently not commonly practiced uh, in wa water for, um, as particularly for COVID-19, but also for other human viruses. Um, so we have some limitation there with understanding what fraction of the viruses that are present in water are actually infectious. And so we have another tool we can use now, which are generally known as molecular methods or PCR. And that's where we look for segments of the RNA or the genome um, that's present in the water sample. So we can look for a bunch of different segments that we know are particular to that virus, or we can even look for the whole genome. Um, these methods are pretty quick. We could do them in a couple hours or half a day, uh, typically, and they're pretty specific. They tell us that you actually detected that specific virus and not a similar virus. Unfortunately, these methods don't tell us if that virus was infectious because it does need to have that um, genome and the capsid, or rather in this case, the envelope to cause infection, and that all needs to be intact. So just detecting a piece of its RNA um, doesn't tell us if that virus was present in a, a state that can actually make us sick or have an implication to human health risk. Um, these methods are also impacted by some inhibitors that can be in wastewater, so we have to be careful um, when we look at the data that's presented that the scientists actually use some good quality control in their method. So some information now looking at, so we've talked a little bit about viruses in general. We're going to start to talk more specifically about COVID-19. So for coronaviruses, and we know this is a family of envelope viruses with RNA genomes, and they're generally categorized in two, two groups. Um, but the point of this slide is to show you the nomenclature that we're using for the novel coronavirus that we're talking about today. We know that there have been three in the last two decades. And this one has gone through a whole series of renaming. Just recently, there's been a push from China, a China virology group to rename this as human COV-19. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we'll be talking about the disease as COVID-19 based on the WHO nomenclature. And when we're talking specifically about the virus, we're using the nomenclature SARS-CoV-2. So what do we know? about uh, COVID-19 right now. We know, of course, that it's impacted almost the entire globe, every country. Uh, we know in New Zealand, um, there's over a thousand cases and 21 deaths and many have recovered. Um, we know that globally, the mortality rate is about one to 5%, depending on different measures that are taken. And I'm sure we're all very familiar with what the symptoms are. We know that this virus is spread person to person mainly and not typically through water. Um, there's been no reports of that. Um, but it's important for us to really understand, you know, how, why we say, you know, a two meter distance for social distancing. Um, because, you know, if you think you're covering your cough or your sneeze and, um, you know, you're not right in someone else's face, um, how could you, you know, transmit the virus to your, you know, friend that you might be having coffee with? And so what happens is when you're speaking, you, your speech does produce some droplets uh, that can are pretty heavy and they can fall on you know, your laptop or your phone or the table where you're having uh, coffee with a friend. And then they may touch that surface and pick up the virus on their hand and then touch somewhere on their face and contract the virus that way. So we know that there is some level of persistence on surfaces in those droplets. And that's where the whole basis for the social distancing comes from for this virus. We also know that the 
um, viral load in the upper respiratory tract is quite high. And so that contributes to um, widespread transmission. Um, and that that can happen even when a person is asymptomatic, which is very different from the first SARS that we encountered in 2002 to 2003, where people were more um, communicable or, or the risk of transmission was higher once the person was hospitalized and showing more symptoms. So that was easier to contain. Just come back here. So I mentioned that we know it can persist on surfaces. And there was one study done um, where they looked at uh, a culture method. So looked at how long does it remain infectious on surfaces. And we typically saw that more porous uh, surfaces like cardboard had um, shorter persistence in terms of the number of hours than uh, you know, less porous surfaces like plastic and copper being a antimicrobial, you know, saw a shorter time. Um, so where surfaces may be becoming contaminated, uh, we are encouraging, you know, cleaning of those surfaces frequently. And because the virus envelope is sort of a lipid, it's fatty, it can easily be inactivated with just soap and water. And so that's effective uh, for disinfecting or cleaning surfaces to prevent transmission that way. And, um, you know, Today we're going to be talking a lot about the virus in water and the potential risk of transmission there, but we know that the highest risk is from person-to-person -person contact. So in our industry, when people are being called to work, that's where we want to really limit transmission is when people have to work closely with someone else. So we know that the virus has been detected in feces. Um, we want to think about, you know, what are the risks to wastewater operators? What's the risk of the virus being present and persisting in the raw wastewater and in, through wastewater treatment? So um, it was detected in feces and we have some evidence to suggest why that might be. We know that this particular virus is capable of binding to human cells in the lung and the small intestine. It specifically binds to this protein on your cells called ACE2. And that's expressed on many organs in your body, but most predominantly in the lungs and the small intestine. And so um, the RNA of this virus, its genome, was detected in the stool of the first confirmed case in the United States and uh, in several other cases in China. Um, and we know that SARS-1 had similar um, detection in feces up to 100 days after someone was infected, and that was typically for people who were immunocompromised. So we know, for example, from hospitals, um, any, any sewage catchments from hospitals may have higher loads of uh, COVID-19 if it is persisting there. So this uh, research suggests that the virus could be transmitted through a potential fecal oral route. We don't have enough information to say that for sure yet. Um, and there's no, there was no detection of the viral RNA in urine, so that's positive. Yes. Here's an electron micrograph of the virus. You know, we can confirm that the, this virus may have been active in the feces because we see it has its whole intact uh, capsid there with the spiky proteins. Um, we know that it's also been detected in sewage, so there's been quite a um, a lot of information coming from the Netherlands because they're doing a national survey on the detecting the RNA of this virus in their wastewater. So they initially did a test on February 6th before they had their first case on February 27th. And at that time, they didn't detect any of the RNA using the method that they quickly came up with. And then um, they started monitoring for the virus in their wastewater and they detected the RNA within the first week after the first case was announced. So that would have been about March 5th that they detected that first um, positive sample from wastewater collection. And they haven't detected any RNA in the effluent of one of their wastewater treatment plants that they've been monitoring that uses anaerobic digestion. So this gives us a little bit of information on a couple of things um, that they may be able to track sort of the presence of the virus um, within a community by looking at the wastewater and that um, whatever treatment they were using at this particular wastewater system seemed to be effective for removing 
uh, the virus and also its RNA. Um, last week, the Water Research Foundation in the United States held a webinar um, where they were reporting survey results, looking at how many water utilities in the US are looking for this virus in their wastewater. So they found that 84% of the 169 utilities who responded are monitoring for the SARS RNA in their wastewater. So that's going to give us a whole body of uh, literature research to look at, you know, how persistent um, are these viruses in the wastewater when a community has cases. Uh, all of these studies are only looking at the RNA and none of them are using culture methods. So it's not going to tell us about whether the virus is infectious in wastewater. So um, I'm just making sure this isn't needed. So let's look at the persistence then in water and wastewater. So we know that um, it may be present in the raw wastewater. And we have a couple of studies that looked at uh, the persistence of other coronaviruses in these environments. So uh, coronaviruses that infect uh, other species. And so this table is showing the days to achieve 99% reduction in infectivity uh, of the virus. So they were looking at, um, at uh, culture method. And so we can look at the difference at four degrees uh, in a wastewater suspension and 25 degrees. And we can see the persistence at four degrees was much longer, maybe up to two months or a little bit more. Uh, relative to one week at 25 degrees. So there's a significant relationship with temperature there. Um, and so in these, uh, you guys are probably in a bit of a warmer season now, but we're, we're just entering our warmer season. Um, and so we've been in a cold climate with our COVID outbreak. So we had many concerns about this persistence. In a surface water source, one study told us that the coronavirus uh, persisted for uh, two weeks. And in filtered tap water that was dechlorinated, uh, they found that the virus can persist for a very long time at four degrees and even up to three weeks at 25 degrees. So we know that the virus may persist um, and these are laboratory conditions. So probably out in the natural environment, the persistence would be less because there'd be biological inactivation, inactivation by sunlight, that kind of thing. Um, but it gives us sort of a ballpark of what to expect. For example, if we had a, an overflow or a bypass of raw wastewater into a surface water. So to summarize this section, we have some preliminary information. We know that the virus is mainly transmitted from person to person, and that can happen when someone is asymptomatic or presymptomatic. We know the RNA has been detected in feces and um, at wastewater treatment plants. And we know that um, it uh, typically maintains its infectivity longer in colder environments. Um, and then we have all these unknowns. We don't know the viral load of infectious uh, virus coming into wastewater treatment plant or how long it persists there or what the risk of contracting it from wastewater processes is or if it is being transmitted by the fecal oral route in the community. So this is a highly active um, area of research right now. So let's now look at the treatment efficacy, you know, at a wastewater treatment plant and also um, with respect to drinking water processes. So typically viruses can be inactivated through a couple of ways. They need that genome and the envelope or capsid to cause infection. So we can cause damage to the viral RNA that can be uh, caused by ultraviolet light. And that would prevent that virus from being able to infect and replicate itself and cause infection. Um, and we can also cause damage to the surface proteins of that virus. And that can be done with a whole range of disinfectants because again, this lipid envelope of this virus is not very stable uh, with respect to, you know, 0.5% chlorine or bleach. 60% um, or more of alcohol, soaps, or even thermal inactivation, uh, we suspect at least 70 degrees or more, maybe less, uh, which was also true for the first SARS outbreak. So um, we can look at how effective we think wastewater treatment will be. And we know that in general, um, the inactivation by secondary wastewater treatment prior to disinfection is highly variable depending on how you operate your processes and which processes you have in place. And we know that can range from 
insignificant to more than two log. Um, so we're left looking at, you know, how effective is disinfection for these viruses in wastewater? And I know in New Zealand, you're mostly looking at the efficacy of ultraviolet light. Um, and in general, we also can talk about coronaviruses and other studies we've seen um, that looked at their removal with respect to surrogates and indicators. And we know from those studies that um, coronaviruses in general, because of their structure, are more susceptible to disinfection by UV or chlorine or other methods um, than the typical indicators that we're using. So that's comforting. And um, we know that you know any damage to that envelope is going to render that virus non-infectious. So we can look at the efficacy of ultraviolet light in wastewater disinfection. We know, you know there's extensive body of literature from the 90s essentially looking at how effective UV can be for uh, the inactivation of viruses in wastewater. Um, we know it can be very effective, but it really depends on the design and not all systems are designed specifically to target viruses. Here in Ontario and Canada, our um, performance for microbial inactivation is monitored by E. coli uh, disinfection. So that doesn't necessarily correlate with um, the inactivation of viruses. And we know the dose will be dependent on your specific system. So we can't say exactly um, how much uh, COVID-19 might be removed by your particular process. So now we can look at, you know, what's the risk um, for drinking water treatment plants? And you probably are already aware that common disinfection methods used in water treatment are expected to be effective for the inactivation of coronaviruses when they're you know, performed as designed. And so I've posted some general you know, values that we know from the literature. You know, we know conventional filtration will remove up to two log, uh, chlorination will remove more than four log typically, and UV will remove up to three log or more. Um, so we expect that you know, the barriers that you have in place are, you know, if they're taking care of other human viruses, then they're taking care of COVID-19 as well. Um, I wanted to sort of reiterate, though, that uh, certainly we should be ensuring that disinfection at our drinking water treatment plants is being continuously monitored to ensure that, you know, here we call them credits, that you're achieving your uh, microbial inactivation uh, consistently. And I also wanted to make a plug for uh, the statistical tool that we can use called quantitative microbial risk assessment. So if you are concerned about um, viruses that may be passing through your treatment plant, um, this is a tool that you can use to you know, understand how effective each of your barriers is for pathogens like these. Um, plan for emergencies like this, such as you know, what if you lost chlorination for 30 minutes? How long until you have to issue a boil water advisory? Um, and this tool can also help you prioritize which additional processes may be a best fit for your, your plant or your site. A little plug there. Um, so next we'll look at the uh, considerations for operators. Checking my time. And so we know that there is some risk because we believe that there may be um, infectious COVID-19 virus in the raw wastewater. And so the, these processes may generate droplets, and we know that droplets are generally how the virus can be transmitted. Those droplets may you know, land on surfaces uh, near those basins in those areas. And if we are not you know, have practicing routine disinfection, sanitation practices, um, or wearing proper PPE, personal protective equipment, seem called the same thing, um, then a nearby worker could potentially become infected. They may touch those areas and touch their face before washing their hands. Um, and then they may transmit this illness to their family or their community. And so um, there's certainly some barriers we can think about along this transmission path to limit uh, their risk. And so those are summarized here. And I'll just uh, quickly skim through these. And uh, I assume Dave might make these slides available for you to review afterwards. Um, but here we typically perform a hazard assessment when we're looking at different sites at a wastewater treatment plant. So certainly we wanna be reviewing those biological risks or bloodborne pathogens um, and wearing proper PPE for those types of uh, risks. 
Um, we want to ensure that staff are social distancing when they can, um, particularly during deliveries or other work that uh, requires more than one person. There's been a lot of questions on specific PPE that should be worn. And so, um, you know, anywhere droplets might land, we want to make sure that those clothes and, and those garments are, are waterproof and that they're being changed. Um, and then protecting our face, you know, our eyes, nose and mouth when we're working with someone else. Um, one of the areas where we do recommend wearing a mask is if someone does become ill on site, then they be may become a known case and they need to leave site as soon as possible, but they also should be fitted with a mask at that time. Um, we think that those surfaces where droplets may land should be routinely washed. I see this has shifted, um, but uh, you know we want to be disinfecting those commonly touched surfaces like keyboards, cell phones, light switches, lunch rooms, in between shifts, in between staff, um, routinely. And we want to be providing hand washing stations and hand sanitizer, making sure that's all stocked. And of course, making sure, well not of course, but making sure our operators are washing their hands before they're applying PPE, particularly on the face, and then um, after removing their PPE. So uh, continuing with the hand washing steps in between there. Um, communicating to your staff if a member becomes ill, ensuring staff who are ill or have cared for known case stay home, sure we're all now very familiar with these rules. Um, many of our plants have you know, split their shifts uh, and so they are not having shift change meetings, they are doing those remotely or over the phone, that kind of thing. And then really thinking about how they can prevent transmission of anything from the plant to their own homes and thinking about shared vehicles and, and all of those surfaces being disinfected as well. So one of the things we get asked about a lot is about masks, particularly. This has been a hot topic in the media for a little while. And so we know that a mask could help um, reduce the transmission of the virus. It's really just one barrier. It cannot be relied on on its own. The virus may pass through several layers of fabric. It's very small. Even some uh, medical grade masks, it may pass through. So it's really only removed when it's associated with a droplet. Um, and so we have to, you know, make sure that that's fitted properly, that the mouth and nose are fully covered, the covering fits snugly against the sides of the face and around the nose bridge as well, um, that you don't have any difficulty breathing when you're wearing it or you might be adjusting it, you don't want to be touching your face more because you're wearing this mask. So definitely want to be applying the mask with um, clean hands. And you know, avoid touching your face or your eyes when you're applying that mask. And then after you're finished using it, that you are washing your hands after and that the mask is being laundered. Um, those masks may not be super durable if they're washed many times. So um, there is some guidance on how to make homemade masks. And uh, what I read was that there should be at least four layers of cotton or two layers of cotton with a a layer of tightly woven you know quilting fabric felt or flannel in between to improve um, the filtration essentially and there were some cautions about you know children under two shouldn't be wearing these masks and and other things from the cdc that you can look to there so my last section is on addressing the public and there's a couple of concerns that come now with knowing that uh, the virus may be present and persist in in raw wastewater, which then may impact surface waters during an overflow or rain event. I know you guys are in a drought, so um, probably you're not too concerned about rain events, but um, nevertheless, you may have bypasses. And so this is where we um, have some concern that once the virus might make its way into a surface water, that its survival could be on the order of weeks in warm conditions, two months in cold conditions, you know, down around that five degrees Celsius point. And so we don't have any information, you know, scientifically to say that this for sure happens, um, but we want to be diligent given the uncertainty and take a precautionary approach. So we are encouraging public notices and restricting access to these areas um, during this time. The other uh, concern when it comes to the public and maybe yourselves is the issue with stagnant water in all these buildings that have remained dormant 
um, over the last few months. And so there was a webinar uh, put on by the Ontario Municipal Water Association, which I provided the link below, um, which goes into all the details on this topic. But essentially, stagnant water in commercial buildings is a concern because mainly you'll lose that chlorine residual within about a week. And then you'll, you know, you may have issues with corrosion, iron corrosion specifically, or losing your corrosion control if you're using that. Um, changes in the stability of scale, so you may be surprised when you turn those taps back on, <clears throat> especially if they have the little aerator caps. Um, an increase in the growth of organisms in the absence of that chlorine residual, um, and possible increases in uh, disinfection byproducts with the chlorine residual hanging on there, I'm not really sure on any uh, scientific data on that. Um, maybe an increase in taste and odor compounds. So the general recommendations are, um, and I know you're in a drought, so you wanna be careful with uh, using a lot of water for this purpose and making sure that not all of your buildings are doing this at once, which could push an overflow at your receiving wastewater treatment plant. But essentially you'll remove all the filters on those taps, aerators, flush the lines from the closest tap at the entry point to the building to the furthest. And the recommendation is 10 to 30 minutes with cold water and a typical household water tank, hot water tank would take about 45 minutes um, to completely flush and that's also recommended. And so on April 3rd, the American Water Works Association published some guidance on these measures. So you can look to that resource as well for um, preventing any unintended human health impacts from these dormant buildings, plumbing. So that takes me to my summary. I think I've mostly stayed on time for Dave. Um, so we have a couple of cr critical control points that come out of this presentation. The first is workers who are around open basins at a wastewater treatment plant. We know that this may produce droplets. We're not sure about the risk of aerosols right now. There is some research that Stantec may be participating in um, spill the beans <laughs> to, on uh, those risks. And so we wanna make sure that uh, any, any risk is uh, assumed. And so we wanna be wearing proper PPE, um, proper laundering as we laid out, uh, routinely disinfecting. We have those guidelines for um, community exposure from combined sewer overflows. And of course, I'm sure we're all now very familiar with the controls for meetings that can be held elsewhere. And so that brings me to our infographic that we created to better understand, you know, the transmission of this virus in the urban water cycle. And so we may have viruses entering our wastewater system from people who are infected, who are staying at home or in a hospital, and uh, they may be on a septic tank or that's being collected at a wastewater treatment plant. So there may be some risk you know, at the wastewater treatment plant, um, or there may be overflows and bypasses that impact receiving surface waters. Um, and then those source, those may be a source for drinking water. Um, but we do expect that, of course, now we know treatment at drinking water treatment plants to be effective for removing uh, COVID among other human viruses. So we trust that our drinking water supply is safe. So I think I'll leave this infographic up while uh, Dave takes some questions and go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Fantastic. Um, yeah, and we've had a couple of questions come through, which I will read out. Just a reminder, that, um, folks, there's a, um, a, a question box that you can type your questions into. Um, and as I said, we've had a couple come through, which is great. Um, so type those away and, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. But Nicole, um, one that's come through here is um, you referred to you washing your hands with soap and water. Does the, um, the term wash with soap and water uh, mean natural soap or does it also include synthetic soaps? Um, you know, anything with surfactant in it? Mm -hmm. uh, I would expect that anything with surfactant in it would be effective. Um, and in any case, we wanna make sure that we're following the guidance for washing our hands, which can almost be equally effective regardless of whatever kind of soap you're using. Um, so we want to be washing our hands for at least 20 seconds and we're washing the front, you know, the palms of our hands as well as in between our fingers 
and the back of our hands and in our nails as well. Um, and warm water will help there because we know that of course the, the warm water will help the fat, the fatty envelope of the virus dissolve and become inactivated. So I think all of those things combined, um, the type of surfactant shouldn't be very uh, relevant. Thanks, Nicole. Here's a, here's a good one. Uh, what would you recommend for utilities that don't chlorinate their groundwater supply under standard practice? Should they be emergency chlorinating given the current epidemic? Great. Uh, thank you for the question. So um, my response to this question is that the risk that we anticipate from coronavirus in a system like that is not higher than what risk you might see from other human viruses. Um, so I think Dave and I had a discussion on, you know, the fact that typically in New Zealand, a secured groundwater source um, it does, may not require uh, chlorination, but an unsecured source would require chlorination. So an unsecured source that may be susceptible to contamination from uh, other land uses or uh, surface waters or septic systems or other fecal contamination, say from agricultural manure application or agricultural practices, those should require chlorination, whether we're having a coronavirus pandemic or not. Um, and we know that um, there's other viruses that are passed through the fecal oral route, like adenovirus, rotavirus, norovirus, human enteric viruses. And they're typically shed by an infected person in very high loads, frankly, that may pass through typical wastewater treatment, depending on how effective your UV is um, and the design of it. And so uh, I wouldn't expect the load from COVID to be higher than that. And we don't think that, you know, we don't have really strong evidence yet to say this is passed through the fecal oral route. So, so I would say that the risk is not more than for other human viruses. I, I just had a follow-up question uh, for that one, Nicole. Um, even if the source is secure, what about recontamination risks in the distribution system, say from a leaky sewer pipe? Okay. Would you, um, yeah, how about that? Great, um, it is a risk. Uh, which is typically why many systems will look to having some type of residual oxidant in the distribution system. We did consider putting that, our graphic designer actually was very keen to put that in our infographic, which we decided against because we didn't want to raise unnecessary alarm among the community. Because again, we didn't feel like that risk was higher because of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so I think my former statement still stands. Hmm. I am in support of disinfection for distribution systems given that risk to human health though. Thanks. Um, another question here, uh, and thanks for sending them through. They're coming through thick and fast, which is great. Uh, does the presence of COVID in wastewater change the risk profile to operators significantly? I.e., is the infectivity greater than other viruses which are generally present in wastewater and controlled through standard operating practices and PPE? It's a golden question we'd all like an answer to. I wish I had it for you. Uh, we don't know what the infectious dose is. That's what we call that in virology, I guess, um, or in risk assessment. Um, typically, there's for a healthy individual, there's an infectious dose. Say it's you know 100 or a million Salmonella bacteria that you actually have to ingest to you know show symptoms or be infected, have them pass through the acid in your gut um, and cause infection. Um, but with this virus, we don't know what the infectious dose is, and um, we. Typically, it's very low for viruses anyway. Um, they're, they can be fairly robust, enteric viruses can be. Um, so for this virus, I think still the main risk is person to person. We know that it's in very high loads in the respiratory tract and certainly people you know, are probably who are infected are spitting into their sinks and that's also going down the drain You know, if they're vomiting or um, brushing their teeth or rinsing their mouth, that, that kind of thing. Um, so the virus may be entering the sewer system from that uh, human source as well. I don't think the risk is greater um, for operators than for 
necessarily other uh, human risks in terms of coming in contact with it, but I think the health risk is probably greater. You know, the health risk for an operator for being exposed to one of these enteric viruses, they probably already have some immunity to that, either because their kids went to daycare and got it and brought it home, or because they've just been exposed to these micro doses over their uh, occupational life. Um, but the risk for, you know, having issues, medical issues from COVID is higher. So I do think it's important to practice all the PPE that is typically encouraged around uh, exposure to bloodborne pathogens. The main risk there is, this, is the surface contact, that the operator may touch something and then touch their face. Mm. Thanks, Nicole. Another one here. Uh, should we recommend dosing of hypo to the sewer manhole of a COVID treating hospital? Okay. Um, no. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Uh, I do have an additional slide. I'm not sure if I kept it in, actually. Uh, I think I may have left it out. Um, so one of the limitations with chlorination of wastewater is that that chlorine is going to react with ammonia. Um, ammonia is nitrogen, and it's going to produce chloramines instead of free available chlorine or total free chlorine residual. And it's only the free chlorine residual that's actually effective against pathogens. So when the chlorine that you've dosed is reacting with ammonia, which is from people's urine, typically, um, you're only producing chloramines, which are not very effective at typical doses um, for inactivating viruses. So you could consider dumping a very large amount of chlorine, um, but you're going to be dealing with a lot of disinfection byproducts produced in the um, environment, uh, and you may not achieve effective inactivation of uh, COVID-19. So um, we suspect that the persistence of COVID-19 in wastewater is, um, raw wastewater is, uh, in a typical system is actually much shorter than what the literature shows, like maybe on the order of two days. And so um, it's possible that the, the concentration coming into the wastewater treatment plant is very low. It's, it's getting diluted as well as it makes its way there and, and blends with other sewer collected waters. Um, so I think it's just important to have effective PPE and that that would be an unnecessary chemical use. That's strictly my opinion. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I saw one of the recordings of your North American webinar and um, one of the questions that was asked at the, uh, on that was around the, um, the contamination path through the office environment, say perhaps the office of a treatment plant, um, you know, by handling paperwork and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and that webinar you ran was a month ago. Has there been any update um, on, on the risks of, of um, passing this on through handling paperwork? There's not a significant update. Um, my advice has changed, which is to avoid paperwork altogether anyway. It's 2020. <laughs> and um, you may look to using sort of an online, um, you know, maybe a, I don't I support Google Docs you know, personally, but um, it's a good tool as an example um, that, you know, you could have that app on, on the operator's phone. They could enter the data, you know, what's the turbidity, what are the parameters that they need to be recording, and the manager can log in and see that data. So that's a maybe a more effective way to just cut through all of that risk of transmission altogether. The guidance on handling, for example, mail, which would be a letter mail, which I assume would be a similar risk, um, although maybe a bit higher to wastewater treatment plant. But the guidance is simply to wash your hands after handling paperwork. And we know that the persistence on porous surfaces is typically less than other surfaces. So um, if you have to handle mail, maybe um, you could wait a few days before handling it after the operator or um, wash your hands after. Thanks. Um, here's another one here. Um, the webinar states this could be possible, but is there any evidence or reports of COVID-19 viruses actually being found in raw water supplies to water treatment plants? Oh, for drinking water supply, yes. in drinking water supply. 
no, we don't have any um, new research on that end, and I'm not aware of any studies that are looking at that specifically. Excellent. Uh, another one, what is the risk to an operator using a jet cleaner for cleaning out sewer mains? Uh, in, oh, like in terms, like a clog or something like that. Yeah. Or at, the grate, at yep. the grit collection, possibly. In a distribution um, uh, system where you might need to get in and, and jet clean a, a sewer out. Yeah. Um, at this time, we're not recommending entering a manhole, but certainly, you know, in North America, we've had issues with um, critical work that's necessary as people were using things other than toilet paper. Um, so we had to re-educate our public a little bit about what wipes cannot go down the drain. Um, so certainly that, that needs to be cleared. And so we do think that there is potential risk. Um, that would be, you know, the highest viral load if it is there in the sewer system. Um, so we recommend, you know, a well-fitted mask, uh, as I described, being applied with clean hands, uh, goggles or a face shield to protect the eyes because it can enter you know, through the eyes and the nose as well. Um, a complete coverall, waterproof gloves and rubber boots. And so you're going to be entering, doing the work, and then when you leave that system, you may touch handrails, you may touch other surfaces when you exit. So you want to be putting all that PPE then into say a garbage bag, a uh, plastic bag um, that can then be taken care of and washing your hands and disinfecting any of those surfaces that you touched on your way out of the manhole. Thanks, okay, another one here. Do we know anything about the size of the virus and the consequent effectiveness of microfiltration or ultrafiltration membranes? Mm -hmm. For, okay, um, the virus is about 100 millimeter, nanometers, um, <laughs> nanometers in diameter. Um, we know that bacteria are around the size of one to you know, 10 micron, and these viruses, viruses are generally 10 to 200 nanometers. So this one is a little bit larger given that it has the envelope around 100 nanometers. Um, I'm not sure how that translates to various membranes. You know, they're all patented and have their different molecular size exclusions, but um, there is some information on that. And in general, the structure of this virus is very, very similar to SARS-1 uh, from 2002 to 2003. So we do think there is, uh, you could look to that literature to tell you a little bit more about the structure, the size of this virus. Thanks, we're nearly done with questions. There's one more here. Um, the molecular method indicates presence, but not infectious nature of the virus. Has the culture method been used to gain this information? Yes, um, it hasn't. We don't have a great culture method. There's a titration method that's being used in some China studies, um, which is very similar uh, culture method. It doesn't tell us for sure the, the quantity of the virus per se that we detect, um, but it gives us sort of a relative uh, quantity in a given sample. Um, so, um, sorry. That method, ha sorry, it's been used in, um, was there a particular matrix or just thinking uh, about? Sorry, no, I, I um, didn't have any more information on, than okay. that. Um, but but uh, the, the, the person who asked the question by all means can come back to us um, um, after the, the webinar and we can follow that up. Um, oh, there was yeah, one I'll area just that... add one comment to that then, yeah. um, just to clarify. So the, the molecular method, it, it, we currently have sequences for three gene segments of the virus, and then we have a sequence for the full genome. Using the full genome sequence is a little tricky because the virus will mutate a little bit as it's passed through the community. Um, so we might miss it. Uh, so we tend to look for these sort of conserved sequences that it needs um, to continue to be a COVID virus um, or SARS-2. So the molecular method tells us that a piece of the genome is there. It doesn't necessarily tell us that the virus is present. It tells us some remnant of the genome is there. Um, uh, yeah, that, just to clarify that. 
I think I've got two questions left. One is, would, would UV alone be sufficient if chlorine was not part of an existing treatment process? At a treatment? drinking water treatment yeah. facility? Yeah. I assume. Um, it depends on the design. Uh, typically, it's probably designed for four log inactivation, or it may be designed for adenovirus if it's the only uh, disinfection or only barrier for viruses. And we know that adenoviruses are the most resistant viruses to disinfect or UV than uh, all the other human known viruses. So if your system is designed for four log inactivation of other viruses or for four log inactivation of adenovirus, then certainly I would expect that that's protective. It doesn't provide the residual in the distribution system like we already addressed. Thanks. And then finally, I had a question around the stormwater networks. Um, has there been any investigation or research into risks? Um, obviously, it's probably not of the same nature as a wastewater network, but um, would, would still operators would still need to be mindful of that, I, I presume. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any additional information with respect to its uh, persistence there. We suspect it to be susceptible to sunlight um, to some extent, so its persistence there is likely low, and I think the risk is low uh, relative to these other environments and, and mm -hmm. being around other people. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, have addressed all the questions that came through, so thank you very much, folks. I I'd like to um, just close out by um, thanking you, Nicole, for the for the time and um, you've put in. I know it's probably getting quite late, and um, we must uh, get you off your computer before it automatically restarts. I think you handed, handled that IT curveball pretty well. Um, thank you very much. And um, so that we've had a good client turnout, um, clients represented from right across New Zealand, which is which is great. And because obviously it's, it's such a um, you know, hot topic at the moment. So uh, the slides, if anyone would like a copy of the slides, please uh, come back and, and contact either your local contact or, or email myself directly. We'd be happy to provide those. Um, and um, any further follow-up questions, of course, um, you just send them through. And I'm sure Nicole or, or any other fantastic names on the screen there, Joe, Jack Angelo, David Panitsky or Art Umble would be, uh, would be happy to, to um, clarify some answers. So thank you very much, folks. We'll, um, we'll draw this webinar to a close. Thank you.